The company has agreed that we should go to Lavi for a week and interview people. I'm a bit afraid of taking tough people on a trip of this nature. You know, must make some safety rules, you know. Everybody carries cell phones, no one works alone. I made some preliminary contacts with Rebecca Hilliker, the head of the theater department at the University of Wyoming. She's hosting a party for us our first, our first night there, and promised to introduce us to possible interviewees. I must admit, when I first heard you were thinking of coming here, when you first called me, I thought, you just kicked me in the stomach. Why are you doing this to me? But then I thought, that's stupid. You're not doing this to me. And I thought about it and decided that there's been so much negative closure on this whole thing, and the students really need to talk. I mean, because when it first happened, there was so much talk, and then the media dissented, and all dialogue stopped. You know, I really love my students because they're free thinkers. You may not like what they have to say. You may not like their opinions because, well, they can be very redneck. <laughs> But they're truthful and they're honest. So there's, there's an excitement here. There's a dynamic in the education that I didn't have when I was teaching in the Midwest in North Dakota because there, oh, there was so much puritanism that dictated the way people thought, viewed the world. They didn't have an opinion. I mean, I couldn't get them to express an opinion. Quite honestly, I'd rather have opinions I don't like and have that dynamic in the education. Oh, there's a student I think you should talk to. His name is Jedediah Schultz. Well, I've lived in Wyoming my whole life. You know, the family has been in Wyoming for generations. So when it came time to go to college, my parents can't, sorry, couldn't afford to send me to college. And I wanted to study theater. So I knew the only way I was going to get to college is if I got a scholarship. And uh, every year they have this big competition, this huge Wyoming State high school competition. And uh, I knew if I didn't take first place in duets, that I wasn't going to get a scholarship. I mean, I never, ever gone against my parents' wishes. So it's kind of worth it. But I decided to do it. And you know, the only thing I can remember about the competition is that when we were done, you know, me and my scene partner, we came up to each other and we shook hands. And then there was a standing ovation. It, it was amazing. I mean, we took first place and we won. And I mean, that's how I can afford to be here at the university because of that scene. It was one of the greatest moments of my life. And my parents weren't there. And you know, to this day, that's the one thing my parents never saw me do. And uh, thinking back on it, I think, you know, why did I oppose my parents? Because I'm not gay, so why don't I do it? And I guess the only honest answer I have is, I wanted to win. I mean, it was such a good scene. It was like the best scene. You know, Mr. Kushner, maybe you can help. Company member Greg Pirati. And whenever I think about Matthew, I think about his incredible beaming smile. I mean, he would just walk in and he'd be like, you know, and he would just smile at everyone. It just made you feel great. And he would like stare people down in the coffee shop because he wanted to sit on the end seat so he could talk to me while I was working. And if anybody was sitting in that seat, he would just sit there and stare at them until they left. Then he would just play his spot. But Matthew definitely had a political side to him. He was really into political affairs. I mean, that's all his big interest was, was watching CNN or MSNBC. That's the only station I ever saw a TV tuned into. Yeah, he was really smart in political affairs. Not so smart on like common sense things. So he moves to let her me to go to school. Lifestyle either, you know what I mean? And he was just bombarded with the press after this happened. They, the media has just been terrible about the whole thing. Oh, I, I, I completely understand it. It must have just been horrible. Yes, I think we're hoping this just all goes away. Um, well, do you think maybe I could call back later and speak to the Reverend? Thank you, I'll do that. Thank you. Why do you have to wear that thing on your head? It's like, when I go to the grocery store, I'm not looking to give people Islam 101, you know what I mean? So I'll be like, well, it's part of my religion, and they'll be, this is the worst part, because they'll be like, I know it's part of your religion, but why? 
It's like, how am I supposed to go into the whole doctrine of physical modesty and my own spiritual relationship with the Lord standing there with my pop and chips, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it's so unreal to me that, yeah, that a group from New York would be writing a play about Laramie. Like, I was picturing, you're going to be in a play about my town. You're going to be on stage in New York, and you're going to be acting like you're us. That, that's so weird. Honey, why wear clothes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mark, how's he going to use that in this play? <laughs> so, uh, this was a big ranch in town. Oh, not just ranch, and this was a big railroad town at one time, too. You know, before they moved everything to Green River and Cheyenne and Omaha. But now it's just a pass-through for the railroad. But, you know, at one time, what was it? The, uh, the, uh, the 50s? The 50s. They had such a roundhouse, and they had such a shop, you could build a complete engine. <laughs> they did. My mom worked there. <laughs> oh, your mom worked in a roundhouse. She cleaned engines. Her name was Minnie. <laughs> I used to sing that song for her. You know that song? No, what song? Running for the roundhouse, man, you can't corner you there. <laughs> Shepherd to his death. 
You bound him to that fence so that may me be more savagely beaten and that he may not escape to tell his tale. You left him out there for 18 hours, knowing full well that he was there, and perhaps having the opportunity to save his life, and you did nothing. This court does not believe that you feel any true remorse for your part in this matter. And I wonder, Mr. Henderson, whether you realize the full gravity of what you have done. Therefore, the court rules as follows. As to count one, that being felony murder with robbery, you are to serve a period of imprisonment for the term of your natural life. As to count three, that being kidnapping, that you are to serve a period of imprisonment for the term of your natural life, with sentencing for count three to run consecutive to sentencing for count one. After the hearing, we spoke with Russell Henderson's Mormon home teacher. I've known Russell's family for 38 years. Russell's 21 years old, so I've known him his entire life. Russell was ordained a priest of the Mormon church, so when this happened, you can imagine disbelief. After the sentencing, the church decided to hold a disciplinary council in which the result was they were going to excommunicate Russell from the Mormon church. What that means is your name is taken off the church's record, so you just disappear. But I will not desert Russell. That is a matter of my religion and my friendship with the family. down in the coffee shop, because he always wanted to sit on the end seat so he could talk to me while I was working. And if anybody was sitting in that seat, he would just sit there and stare at them until they left. Then he would just climb the spot. But Matthew definitely had a political side to him. He was really into political affairs. I mean, that's all his big interest was, was watching